Okay, uh, welcome uh, everyone. Um, we're, we're delighted you can join us uh, tonight for this uh, inaugural uh, professorial lecture from Professor Sharon Hughes. Um, uh, just to do some introductions, so my name, for those of you who don't know it, is Jeff McMullen and I'm uh, the Head of School of Biological Sciences. I'm delighted that uh, Professor Nigel Scollin, Director of uh, IGFS is going to help me take us through the event this evening and of course we have uh, uh, Professor Hughes, Sharon with us, who you, you will all know who will be uh, delivering her lecture in, in a second. So um, just, just a, a welcome as I say to the School of Biological Sciences and the Institute for Global Food Security. We're delighted you're able to join us. Um, it's been a year of, of, of firsts, and, and this is our first attempt at a, a virtual uh, uh, inaugural professorial lecture. So uh, please bear with us. Uh, we're delighted to be able to do it. What we've maybe lost in that informal contact we have in our, in our, in our wonderful building on the Queen's campus, uh, uh, we make up for by the fact that we have so many international guests who've been able to, to join us this evening. Um, so you're, you're very, very welcome. And um, I know uh, Sharon will, will talk about some of that. So just in terms of some of the, 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 the processes and how we'll, we'll organize uh, this evening, you'll note that um, your microphone and video are off. Um, that, that's uh, so that the, the processes can occur um, as smoothly as possible. Um, in a second, um, I will do an introduction to, to Sharon, then we'll hand over to, to Sharon for her, her talk. After that, there'll be an opportunity for some questions uh, and, and answers. Nigel and myself will, will host that. Um, you will be able to put up your hand and then Michael, who we thank for, for helping us with the organization of this, Michael Hills will, will invite you forward to speak. Um, but there's also the opportunity um, to put in questions in the, the Q&A a function at the bottom of the screen, which um, uh, Sharon will do her best to answer. And of, and of course, we'll encourage her along the way. And then uh, Nigel will, will finish the events and then everyone will, will be able to um, go on with the, the rest of their day or their evening, wherever they are. So hopefully that explains how, how we'll do things. Um, and uh, yeah, then, then we'll, we'll, we'll make, a, make a start. So usually at this stage, uh, whenever we, we, we do these events, which are a highlight of the year, and we're delighted that, that we've been able to recommence these, that, that I give a, a bit of an introduction to, to, to all of that Sharon's achieved so far to, to make uh, this, this, this evening um, this, this fantastic uh, event. So Sharon graduated from uh, Bangor University with a, a, a BSc Honours in, in Zoology, and then undertook a, a Master's in Parasitology and uh, Medical Entomology, the Liverpool School of Tropical Medicine, before commencing a PhD in Microbiology at the University of Manchester. After graduating from this, Sharon went on to work for Eurofin Scientific, uh, and then postdocing at Bath before moving to uh, Aberystwyth, initially as a principal uh, investigator in rumen microbiology, uh, and then eventually progressing to senior lecture in animal science. We were delighted to recruit Sharon to the, the School and the Institute at Queen's in 2017, when she joined us as a, a reader in animal science, and then was appointed a professor in 2019. Sharon's research interests span the fundamental discovery science up to and including translational research that has impact on the society in which we, we live. It is largely focused on understanding microbiomes, particularly those of the, the GI tract uh, of livestock animals, but we'll hear a lot more about that uh, from Sharon, uh, so I won't speak any more on that detail. Sharon has a very uh, collaborative and team science approach to the way she, she works, uh, and she's really successful at doing that. Um, since joining Queen's, for example, um, she's been PI or co-I uh, in projects that have been worth over 26 million pounds, uh, and they've involved networks spanning the globe. Sharon publishes her research findings in really high quality uh, research journals, such as Microbiome, Nature Communications, FEMS Microbiology, Ecology, 
and she supervises a really large team of excellent doctoral and postdoctoral scientists. In addition to making uh, these individual contributions, Sharon makes a huge contribution to uh, the school, the institute, and to the university. Uh, she contributes to the microbiology education within our school and institute. She's a director of research, sits on school and institute management boards, and has taken a leading role in our REF preparations and in forging relationships with AFB. And I know we have a number of colleagues from AFB with us tonight. And we know that that will bring both our organisations um, uh, great benefits and also benefits to the people of Northern Ireland. I think for all of this activity, this hard work, and the support that she gives uh, and encouragement, both Nigel and I would really want to thank her uh, for that. Um, there's, not, there's, there's a lot more that can be said about what Sharon does, um, her contribution to learned societies, her internationalization uh, activities, and we can see that from uh, so many colleagues that have joined us from around the, the, the globe tonight, and her editorial leadership of learned journals. So really just to sum things up before we, we move over to, to Sharon, so we can hear what she wants to tell, tell us tonight. Um, Sharon manages all of this fantastic activity with a busy family life, um, a great uh, love of obscure uh, music. Uh, and we might hear more of that later on this evening. So all in all, I think uh, Wales' loss has definitely been Northern Ireland's gain and we're all delighted to share in her success tonight. So without further ado, I'll ask Sharon to deliver her inaugural lecture, Agriculture, Planetary Health and Microbiomes. So over to you, Sharon. Okay, <laughs> can you see it uh, before I start? Yes, okay. <laughs> Well, I'm overwhelmed by that introduction. I'm not sure what to say. Um, I'm also overwhelmed by the number of people um, who have joined to listen to this. I was told uh, 170 participants from 20 countries. So thank you very, very much um, for joining. So what I'm going to do is try and entertain you for the next 30 or, or 40 minutes and take you through the, the story, I guess, to the, from the beginning to where I am now. So many of you will, will know that I am Welsh. Um, it is my first language and English is my second language. And you can see this map of Wales here and where you see that blue spot, that's where I was born and raised and where my family um, continue uh, to farm. So I know I'm very biased, but this is a very beautiful part of Wales. It has an amazing uh, coastline. Um, and I was brought up on a farm there, as you can see from these pictures here. So perhaps um, not unexpected that I went into um, animal science. So, um, at the top there, you have some of Dad's stairs, and at the bottom there, I know my brother would be very embarrassed by that picture, but that was my, my donkey there, myself uh, and Dad as well in that picture. So I was brought up not only with livestock, but any um, animal you could, you could think of, which I think I appreciate it now more than I, I did back then, perhaps. Okay, so, so Jeff said a little bit about this, this, this journey. So I didn't immediately go into animal science. It was quite, a, I guess, a mixed path that I took. So firstly was the BSc in zoology in Bangor. And then I went into parasitology as a, a master's degree. And then after that, a PhD and a postdoc, which were in microbial ecology. The PhD was in Manchester University and the postdoc in University of Bath. And then I joined, um, well, what was then called um, AIGA, a BBSSC um, Institute as a room and microbial ecologist, um, and then developing up into senior lecturer. But by that point in time, AIGA had merged with Aberystwyth University to form IBUS. 
Um, so I guess that's when animal science really started to come into it and using some of the uh, disciplinary expertise I had learnt on the way, particularly on the microbiology side. Um, so as Jeff said, 2017 I came to Queen's and um, something I don't regret at all um, and I progressed to professorship. Okay, <laughs> some of you will see this slide and some of you will laugh and others I think I, I may need to explain this one a little bit. So I, I had I said that I would give this inaugural back in just before Christmas and I was thinking about it on and off and looking for some inspiration, you know, what do you do, what do you say in an inaugural and I was watching um, one of my favourite programmes, Father Ted, which is based in the south of Ireland. And this particular episode is called Christmassy Ted, whereby he obtains a Golden Cleric Award for his contributions to the clergy. And he decides in his acceptance uh, speech um, to actually name and shame everyone who had stood in his way um, during his career and I suddenly thought well that could make a, quite an interesting inaugural but the truth is I have had some fantastic uh, mentors along the way so in fact even if I wanted to I couldn't do that and, and the first I would like to pay particular uh, attention to and thank them very much is Peter Gilbert and Andrew McBain who helped supervise my PhD. So Peter Gilbert has unfortunately passed away for a number of years now, but I could tell you quite a few stories about him. He was very much an eccentric and he um, left a lasting mark on my career. So thank you uh, very much. So for the PhD, I worked on the effects of protozoa on biofilm community dynamics. Now, I know I have some non-scientists in the audience, so uh, I will explain this a little bit. So if you see this picture in blue here, that is a, a protozoan and they live everywhere. They, uh, about 80% of us will have protozoa living in our mouths. Um, this particular one is found um, in fresh water, so they're everywhere. Um, and they graze on bacteria, so they get their nutrients from bacteria. So now I want to just introduce this concept of biofilms. So bacteria in nature, they commonly, they don't exist as single cells, but they exist as these almost like clumps of bacteria and they surround themselves in this sticky matrix. And the analogy that I always use is, is it's akin to building your house. So they build a house for themselves um, and the theory goes that this gives them protection uh, from a lot of situations, particularly grazing by these bacteria eating protozoa. But what we found, okay, when you see the arrow in the graph there, uh, we set up biofilm communities and then added some protozoa in to see what happened to bacterial numbers. And the open circles there show you what happens in the presence of protozoa as compared to the black circles where there's no protozoa. So you can see that they can actually graze. Um, so this was one of the main findings is that these protozoa have developed um, evolutionary mechanisms that allow them to actually uh, take advantage of these bacterial hotspots. But what's really interesting is that they, they don't um, deplete the bacteria completely. And if you monitor this for a lot longer, you see they allow the bacterial numbers to go back up again before they start to, to graze. So they're making sure that they always have a source of food. Okay, so then I moved on to my first postdoctoral position, which was with, um, uh, Michael Brown and Anthony Smith in University of Bath. 
And this again was working with these protozoa that we find in the environment. But this time we were looking at interactions with bacteria, but in a different way, because we know that some bacteria in nature can actually grow within the, the protozoa and they can then spread to the environment. So the protozoa don't manage to actually digest all bacteria. Some bacteria have mechanisms whereby they can really take over the cell and then they explode into the environment. With, so they're actually a reservoir. So it's this concept of protozoa as Trojan horses or even biological gymnasia. What I mean by biological gymnasia is that actually the mechanisms they use to survive in these protozoa are very similar to the mechanisms they use to infect um, our, our um, white blood cells. So it's almost like they use the env environment to practice until they, they come to the real situation and then they can infect, um, they can better affect humans. So the picture here was actually one that I, I took back in the day when I was in the lab. And it shows you this bacterium, uh, methicillin resistant Staphylococcus aureus or MRSA, I'm sure everyone has heard of that, um, that actually has these mechanisms of proliferating in protozoa. Okay, so on to the next bit. So many of you will know these uh, two familiar faces here, particularly Nigel, who is, uh, uh, was on the slide at the beginning. So this is, I guess, I, I guess my epiphany moment is what I would call it, because this is when I started to work with the rumen microbiome and ruminants, and I've never uh, looked back since, because it brings my interest really in agriculture and microbiology together. So the initial project I worked on was understanding the role um, of rumen microbes in ruminant product quality. So the quality, the human health properties of meat and milk. And this was um, a project that was funded by BBSRC and it had two arms to it. So there was one piece of work happening in Aberdeen with Professor John Wallace um, and one arm happening in Aberystwyth with Nigel. And I decided to take on the postdoc uh, in Wales, but I spent a substantial amount of time in the Rowett Research in Institute with John. I was very, very fortunate to be able to do that because he is, remains one of the most knowledgeable people in the, in the field. Okay, before I go on, uh, I think I need to explain just a few things just for the non-scientists in the audience. Uh, and that is, I'll be talking very much about this rumen microbiome from this point onwards. What microbiome really means is the diversity of microbes that are present and what they're actually doing. Um, and ruminants have four compartments to their, to their stomach. And my particular interest is in this compartment here, the rumen, and that is because it's full of microbes. And this is where the animal uh, digests um, the feed. And if they didn't have this organ or all of these microbes, the animal wouldn't survive. So this rumen microbiome here is, is central. So you will have um, bacteria in there protozoa, fungi, and archaea. So this, this ecosystem really appealed to me purely because obviously being brought up on a farm, but the fact that you also have the, such a complex ecosystem as well. Um, and I, I was quite keen to continue some work on the protozoa at that point. In time. Um, so this microbiome, okay, is central for everything uh, to do with productivity, um, product quality, and I just want to invite to highlight the environmental impact. So if you look at the bottom there where I have archaea or methanogens, they are the group of microbes which are responsible for 
producing methane. And, and before we go any for, further, methane is actually burped from the mouth um, of ruminants. It doesn't come out the, the back end very much. Okay, so this first project um, with Nigel and John, we were really um, looking at the fact that meat and milk often get a very bad press. You see it in the media. Um, they're full of these SFAs or saturated fatty acids, and they have less of these human health beneficial polyunsaturated fatty acids. And these saturated fatty acids have been linked to cardiovascular disease and, and many other um, ailments. Yet, um, I know many of you have seen this diagram here <laughs> numerous times, it's what we uh, commonly use to show the issue. So when, when a ruminant eats grass, grass is actually full of these human health beneficial polyunsaturated fatty acids. So the question is, why does that not come through into meat and milk? And it's purely down to this uh, rumen microbiome um, and the fact that the rumen mi microbes, they actually find polyunsaturated fatty acids toxic to them. So they quickly convert them into saturated fatty acids so that they can survive. And about 92 to 96% of dietary lipids would be converted to saturated fats. So therein lies the, the issue. So I spent uh, maybe three or, three or four years um, initially working on this and just trying to understand which microbes were responsible for this. Because if you could understand who was responsible then you could maybe develop ways of manipulating those microbes and stopping them from converting um, so much of the PUFA to saturated fats. Uh, the bottom line is we used experiments whereby we had changed um, by hydrogenation capacity. So we had added fish oil, um, which does slow down by hydrogenation as a way of just being able to compare the microbes present when you fed fish oil versus when you didn't feed fish oil. So we could really pinpoint who's responsible. And, and the answer we got was highly complicated. So many microbes are probably play a certain role. And actually one of the main microbes that um, we think plays a role is also one of the most important for productivity in the animal. So if you were to develop tools to actually inhibit um, those particular microbes, it would also um, have an effect on the growth of the animal or ability to produce milk. Um, and also, as you know, um, I'm fascinated by protozoa, but the rumen protozoa, I, have, I had never seen anything like them before. Um, so these look completely different from the protozoa you would find in ponds, for example. They have highly calcified exoskeletons because the rumen is constantly contracting. It's, it's not an easy environment to live in. Um, so they've developed lots of um, strategies, I guess, to be able to survive um, in that environment. Um, so the picture here on the right hand side shows you some of these protozoa um, next to a, a plant, uh, yeah, plant material. And what, what I saw first, I, when I took a piece of plant material out from the rumen, I noticed immediately these protozoa here, which are called epidinium, and how they were, were associated strongly with the plant, plant material. And as I was watching them, I could see that they were almost going through the cells of the plant material and hoovering up uh, chloroplast material. So the analogy I'd like to use there is think of these as hoovers, essentially. They're, they're going through uh, the plant material, picking up chloroplasts. And chloroplasts are actually, they are the photosynthetic um, cell of the plant. 
but they're also where you find most of the polyunsaturated fatty acids and protein. And what we see here, if we take an image of the epidemium, we can see that they're, what they do is they saturate themselves with um, chloroplasts. And here is an autofluorescing image showing you how many they have inside. So they're actually really rich in polyunsaturated fatty acids and protein. And we, to this day, we have never, we, we don't know why they do this, whether it's because it's a reserve for food or we're still unsure. So then we began to think maybe a bit about these protozoa as vehicles, perhaps, of getting more PUFA into meat and milk, so meat and milk would be healthier. Um, and in order to do that, um, you need to get the microbes to the uh, duodenum because that is where you get most of the absorption of polyunsaturated fatty acids. And unfortunately, uh, we realized as we went down this route that um, protozoa really do not want to flow outside of the rumen. And they use as many mechanisms as possible to stay in there. So they will attach to the cell wall, to the epithelium at the top of the rumen as well. Um, so to this day, we have, we have yet to solve this um, issue of making meat and milk um, healthier. Okay, so the next stage in the journey, I was working with Professor Alison Kingston Smith, still working with, with Nigel and still doing a lot on the, on the lipid side. But now I began to work um, on the core strategic um, BBSSC grant that we had in the, in IGA as it was at that point in time. And I began to um, work on room and plant microbe interactions. Um, and this is really because of these two graphs here. So what you see in the very colorful graph here is that world population growth is, is set to grow to about nine or 10 billion by 2050. And set against this uh, in the other graph, what we see is that countries that didn't consume much meat or, or beef previously are now consuming uh, more and more of it. So there is a real issue here in terms of food security and ensuring that we have enough um, meat and milk for the population as we grow. Now, this is a really complicated area. I won't go into it in, in too much depth, but we know we know that the westernized world consumes too much meat and milk. But then we have countries in Africa that just don't get enough and it inhibits um, development in, in infants. Um, so this is a major big area where, um, where there is an argument for reducing our consumption to an extent. And also within this um, particular project, we were also um, looking at uh, nit nitrogen use efficiency by the animals. So you can see that the intake, um, they, when they eat, they obviously take in a lot of protein and that protein gets um, degraded by the microbes um, in the rumen and then they rebuild it up. And actually, as the microbes flow to the duodenum, they, they give the animal about 50 to 60% of its protein. But you will also have some of the plant that goes through without being digested in the rumen. But one of the issues that we have here, um, many of you will know in the past few years, what we have done to increase meat and milk um, production is to actually increase crude protein intake in these animals because soya was, was cheap at one point. But what you end up with is that most of the nitrogen actually comes out in, in the urine in the other side. And once it's in the soil, it can be converted to nitrous oxide uh, by the soil microbiome. So again, another microbiome there that's really important. And what I want to point out is that nitrous oxide is actually one of the most potent greenhouse gases. It's far more potent than, than methane. 
OK, so I guess using some of the tools that I had gathered um, over the years, uh, what we what we did was we incubated uh, fresh perennial ryegrass in the rumen uh, of cows. And at various time points, we, we took out the contents and we we had a look, first of all, because obviously, you know, I had uh, strong suspicions that there would be biofilm communities and you see them here. These microbes, okay, are building themselves a house uh, on top of the plant material. And the reason that they do this this time is, is, is protection, but also by building that house, they can concentrate, concentrate all of the enzymes that they need to degrade the plant material so it doesn't diffuse out into the um, liquid in the rumen. So it's a mechanism also of being able to increase digestion of plant material. Okay, it gets a little bit more scientific just for a couple of slides. So apologies for those non-scientists in the audience. Um, it, I promise it's only a couple of slides. Um, so when we look at this a bit further and we characterize the microbes that are attached to plant material, particularly the bacteria, we see that there are two phases of colonization. And this is defined by the diversity of the microbes that you have present at different time points when you take the plant material out of the rumen. So we coined this term of primary colonization and that would happen up to um, four hours and then secondary colonization, which happens after four hours. And this is really defined by a switch in the abundance of certain bacterial groups. And when we look at this a little bit further and we actually look at what they're expressing, so the genes that these bacteria are expressing when they're trying to degrade plant material, and we look at the breakdown of carbohydrates, and um, what we see is that in primary colonization, they tend to go for simple sugars. Um, and then during secondary colonization, they will go for the more uh, recalcitrant, the complex carbohydrates. So I think <laughs> the analogy here is they go for sweets before they go for the fruit or the veg. So no different to, to many of us, including myself, I think. OK, uh, I know many of you will look at this and think, oh, my God, what, what is this? So I just I put this here just to show you the complexity of the rumen and the interactions that they all have with each other. And at this point in time, I really need to thank my colleague, uh, Chris Creevy, because when things get um, when we get into hardcore computational biology, I absolutely have to um, rely on Chris um, for that. So all I really want to say from this picture, okay, is that the green lines are positive interactions, red lines are negative interactions. And you can see there's a whole host of different levels of interaction going on there. Um, the ones here in purple tend to have the most interactions. So they could be and they keep the um, community together. But also they could be cheating because it means that if they keep the community together, they can get all the nutrients that the others are supplying without having to do very much themselves. And I just also want to bring in this concept, you know, the bigger the size of the circle, the more dominant these bacterial families are. And you'll see this one here is, is really involved in breaking down uh, plant material um, and that it doesn't have a lot of interactions. So it's actually really quite selfish and does its own thing. So this, this is the complexity that we're dealing with, um, which makes it very challenging um, to manipulate the rumen microbiome if we want to improve uh, on certain aspects of the host phenotype. Okay, so then, um, then IGA at that point in time merged with the University of Aberystwyth, uh, forming IBERS. 
and I took up a lecturer position and went right through to senior lecturer in animal science. So by this point in time, I was uh, fully embedded in animal science. Um, and I was employed by the colleague Kamrai Kenneth Latho. So uh, as I said, my first language is Welsh and the colleague Kamrai Kenneth Latho were part of a, uh, a government incentive to teach more in Welsh. So uh, about two thirds of my teaching in animal science was, was in Welsh. Um, anyway, at that point in time, I also became quite interested in the plight of antimicrobial resistance um, and the role that livestock play in this. And this was really because um, there was quite a lot of funding coming from the Welsh government in this area via the um, life sciences research network. So we began to work a little bit in this area. Sorry, I'm keeping a, an eye on time. Um, and, and I now need to say a big thank you to another colleague, uh, Professor Hilario Montavani, um, who is based in the University of Vizosa in uh, Brazil. He, ha he and his group have been uh, fantastic colleagues in the last few years. And that's demonstrated here in this image. I, I won't go into depth about the image. But essentially, we started to look at antimicrobial resistance in rumen microbes because they flow out into the feces. They can be a source of, um, uh, I guess, resistance going into the environment and a human health concern. So we looked at 435 different um, rumen uh, genomes, so genomes from uh, mainly bacteria. And we found that 84 of them had quite a lot of resistance to numerous different um, groups of antimicrobials, which did give us a, quite a nice publication, but is also a, a huge concern uh, for the farm environment. Um, so also at this point in time, um, I was thinking about the interactions of rumen microbiomes rumen microbes together and whilst you know they work together most of the time in symbiosis in order to break down plant material they are no different to any other microbiome and sometimes they need to compete um, so at this point in time we began to think about what novel antimicrobials could they be producing and could they, as well as being an issue for the spread of antimicrobial resistance, could they also uh, provide a possible answer. So to cut a very long story short, we now have hundreds of novel antimicrobials which are, have been discovered from the rumen microbiome and we are currently um, testing them in a bovine mastitis experiment with raft solutions. So I'm, I'm hoping that will give us um, some nice positive data. Okay, so onwards to uh, Queen's University and what I've been doing here. I have to say a very big thank you to my colleagues in AFPI who have welcomed me from day one. And, you know, most of the work I will show you from this point inwards is with my uh, very valued colleagues in AFPI. So every single thing that I've worked on in the past has continued right through so product quality, whether we're looking at improving production or reducing the environmental impact um, of ruminants or the whole antimicrobial resistance area and developing new novel antimicrobials that can improve upon animal health. So they are strong, strong areas that we, we, all, we look at as a group and with many collaborators. But there is also a little bit of work that we're now starting on monogastrics as well. So some work on poultry and pigs. Um, but I will stick to the theme of uh, ruminants just to, to finish. Um, so many of you will know, you know, ruminants are, are again in the press quite often because um, of the amount of methane that they release. So this 27% of an 
of methane released to the environment comes from enteric fermentation. So what that means is, is um, the methanogens that we find in the rumen and the methane, as I said, is then burped out into the environment. So this is quite a complicated area because in actual fact, you know, fossil fuels do contribute uh, more as a whole um, to greenhouse gas release and climate change. And also there's been some uh, data released from Oxford um, University recently showing that methane um, has a half-life which is much less than carbon dioxide, which means that when methane goes into the atmosphere, it, it degrades more quickly than carbon dioxide. So at the present time, it's really unclear as to what um, effect um, ruminants actually have. But irrespective, there are things we can do and things that we need to do in this area to improve upon the in environmental impact of livestock. And so the story goes that if you um, actually reduce uh, methane release, you will actually get better production because it, it causes them to redirect the energy into breaking down plant material, producing volatile fatty acids uh, as a source of energy. But I would put a caveat on that. That's certainly not the case with ev every single time. But there are some instances where you will see that. Um, and of course, at the minute, production is, is what pays the bills for farmers uh, until we have these new policies that are coming into place, which will um, reward on environmental outcomes. So we are working a lot in this area of methane at the minute. So I had worked on methane before, but in the last three or four years that this has become an even hotter top topic because we've signed up for the Paris uh, Agreement to be carbon neutral by 2050. So it's, it's now more on the agenda than it, than it was before. So we are looking at various dietary interventions. So things you can add to the diet, which um, or, or change the diet uh, to reduce methane. And some of those are microalgae. Seaweeds are very, um, have hit the press quite a lot recently because some of the red um, seaweeds can reduce methane by uh, around 80% or more. Um, and that's when they're added as a very small component of the diet. Uh, the other one here, which is produced by DSM Novozyme, it's called 3NOP and it's currently being licensed. Um, and they're hoping to sell it as a slow release uh, boli for grazing animals as well. And this has been shown as to reduce methane by well, in a recent talk, they were talking about uh, being able to get to about 60 to 80 percent as well. And the other thing we're looking at is, is the crude protein in the diet. So as I said, the tendency has been to put as much protein in the animals as possible to get better production. But of course, soya prices are now um, high. And also there's the environmental impact of bringing our soya uh, over from South America. Um, and the reality is we don't need the levels of crude protein that we've traditionally been feeding. So we're looking at those levels from the aspects of the nitrogen which is released into the environment um, and contributing to nitrous oxide production, as well as looking at their, the effect maybe on methane. And lastly, we're looking at the use of multi swords. So things like um, white clover have been shown to reduce uh, methane. So maybe changing um, the swords that are fed to the animals. And you'll see a list. So this is a cross ruminant species. That's why I have this image in the, in the middle. That's, um, and also involves numerous um, partners. Okay, so I am coming uh, to the end now. Um, so I think really this picture here sums up where we need to go and where much of the science is going at the minute. And that's looking at the farm as a whole 
looking at your carbon and um, nitrogen balance sheets, because ultimately this is where uh, government payments will come from. So we have at the minute numerous calculators available such that you can calculate this. The only caveat I would put on that is that there are a lot of inaccuracies at the minute in our calculators. And that is because, you know, we, we haven't measured methane uh, for animals that are fed different, um, different swords, for example. Um, we don't know fully what the, how much the soil can actually store of carbon or, or trees, etc. cetera. Um, so the, the calculations are, are based on the, our best estimates at this point in time. So I think our role as scientists is to look at these in more of a systems manner and to actually provide the data that will make those calculators more um, accurate. Okay, so this brings me on to how I got to the title. Um, I firmly believe this, in, that the future is interdisciplinary. We have major, major challenges ahead. Um, planetary health and greenhouse gases, for example. And I would argue that agricultural microbiomes, whether we're talking about the rumen or the soil, are, are central um, to planetary health. And likewise, you know, the, the, the health of the planet will affect our ability to provide food. And again, the arrows go both, both ways, because if we're not raising our livestock in an environmentally con conscientious manner, then, then we don't have planetary health and the, our ability to grow other crops will also decrease. And ultimately, you know, this all feeds into um, human health. So we need to realize actually and work together a little bit more because all of these systems are interconnected um, and we need to move towards uh, sustainable agriculture more. Okay, I like this quote from Jonathan Eisen. He said, um, if you give a scientist data or tools and you feed science world for a day, but if you teach them openness, you feed science world for a lifetime. So I'm a firm believer in that. And you will see that from this slide here. The numerous dots at the bottom here are um, researchers and uh, where they're based. Uh, sorry, let me say that again. It's where I have published papers with um, different researchers across the world. And I firmly believe, you know, our our challenges are local, but they are also global, and we need to be working together across the globe on those. So I will start by thanking all collaborators across the world. I also thank uh, colleagues, um, all the students and the postdocs past and present. Um, you know, I don't do this alone, and without these networks, um, I certainly wouldn't be where I am now. So I've just brought out, out these three people here at the side. The first one is Professor Mike Lahane, who is now, I believe, retired. And he was the one in Bangor University that told me, you need to go and think about doing a PhD. And I have to say, I was mind blown by that at the time. A, a, a farmer's daughter from Cardigan going to do a PhD was unheard of. Um, so I went to do the master's first, but eventually I had the uh, confidence to go and do it. And as I say, Professor Peter Gilbert, so much I could say about this inspirational uh, scientist and mentor. Um, so he, he wrote a, a reference for me when I went to Bath University, uh, which said she's an excellent scientist, albeit Welsh. So I, I have to say, I, I knew him well enough to be able to laugh at that. It was very much tongue in cheek, but the HR department in Bath University weren't um, so pleased perhaps. And then last but not least, um, Nigel, who knocked it out of me from the very beginning that uh, we do not do trials, we perform experiments. So I've never written trials in anything um, since working with Nigel. 
And last but certainly not least, if you see on the left hand side at the top, a big thank you to these wonderful ladies who um, are my closest friends since school days. And I was fortunate enough to be given the honour of this chair before COVID struck us. And um, we managed to celebrate and they all dressed up as scientists in my honour. So I hope we can do that again very soon. Uh, beneath them, I would like to just thank these two characters here, my two corgis, who have really kept me going under lockdown. And last but not least, the, the whole family. I wouldn't be here without the support of the family. And in particular, my long suffering husband and my two daughters who have provided a lot of support uh, along the way. So the, there it is, that is my final slide. So thank you so much for joining this inaugural. I hope that was entertaining. <laughs> Sharon, that was fantastic. Just I'm <laughs> scribbling. I'm, I'm I'm not. It's not that I'm dumbstruck by it. it it's the fact that uh, I can't work my technology. So uh, apologies. <laughs> Absolutely fantastic uh, and a, a, a brilliant run through a, a fantastic career so far, and lots of things to do. I. I, I I realize that, that that my my lexicon expands greatly whenever I'm working with certain people in in the school and the institute. Nigel knows this is one of my my themes. I'm a very simple individual, and some of the terminologies I, I've I've heard over the last little while really have, have stretched me. I should be a better Scrabble player than I than I actually am, but I didn't expect didn't expect mentions of Father Ted, uh, burping, um, mergers. Uh, policy uh, and 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 then you, you very eloquently in your in your own language uh, talked about things that I, I can't even imagine what what the, what they are. I, I, so absolutely fantastic. So we we do have uh, more torture for you now, um, where there were there already are some questions that that have come in. So maybe just to to to, to give you um, some time, uh, maybe we can look at those questions. But firstly, maybe we'll ask. If, if anyone wants to raise their hand and we can we can bring people forward and, and, and hear from them and that'll maybe give you time to, 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 to grab your your breath. Any colleagues want to raise their hand and, and, and ask Sharon a question? Okay, so we'll, 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 we'll wait to see if people have the courage to come forward. There are some questions and there's one there starting off from from our colleague Mark E, uh, who's asked a question in relation to methane from cattle and half-life in the atmosphere and what does it break down to? Um, so apparently it's uh, 10 years as opposed to 100 years for, um, for carbon dioxide. What does it break down to is a very good question and I think it's an area yet to be developed. Um, because there is some thinking that it could go to carbon dioxide, which is where it gets a little bit complicated. So that's really the work of the guys in Oxford University, which I can point you towards the thinking there. But at the minute, the IPCC are, are not adopting maybe the half-lives into the cal calculations. Um, so it's still quite a hot topic, I guess. Maybe I can ask you, Sean, just to extend that a little bit uh, and a little bit more pain in around that area, if I may. <laughs> um, you know, this seems to be one of the biggest hot, the hottest subjects in relation to this, this whole methane contribution. Um, how do you see IPCC taking forward um, this this interesting angle from Oxford in terms of half life of methane because that that would radically transform um, the the calculations in around the the impact of ruminants on on our environment. Yeah, it really really would. So I um, 
I have had many conversations with some of the people who sit on the IPCC on this, um, trying to push them uh, forward to adopt um, half-life into their equations. The answer that I get is it's too early days and they want more data uh, around it. But certainly the things may well change, but at the minute, um, they want more proof is the answer that I'm getting. Okay. Yeah, it's really, it's a really exciting, uh, really exciting area there. Mm -hmm. um, colleagues, we're just looking, anybody brave enough to put their hand up, even if you simply want to make a comment, uh, you know, and I know there are many colleagues from around the world, so you have a real opportunity now to put your hand up and we'll, we'll try and capture it if anybody wants to make comments, so please feel uh, 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 you're very welcome. So Matthias, it's good to see you. Uh, please, um, the floor is yours if you can please speak. So, Sharon, first of all, I really, 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 really enjoyed your talk and I really appreciate, uh, you know, all the, the great science you have been doing. And so I'm really delighted uh, to participate today. So one of the questions um, is, you know, I'm sure you guys have been looking into nitrous oxides um, and, you know, despite or let's assume we are fortunate enough that methane might not, from ruminants, might not have the impact, the negative impact it has that we assume it has right now. Um, I mean, I would assume that the impact from nitrous oxides that um, get emitted specifically from manure might still really um, require us to continue to looking into that topic. What is your take on that? Can you expand on that a little? Yeah, and so the, you know, methane has been given the most publicity, um, as, you, as you know. I mean, for everybody tuning in, I've worked for many years with Matthias, and actually much of the work on seaweeds and methane um, has been the brainchild of Mat Matthias. Um, so I think you know, nitrous oxide, it, it isn't given the same publicity. Um, and we, we don't, uh, when, we, when we look at nitrogen balance in the animal, we don't um, monitor how much of that that comes out of the back end is actually converted into nitrous oxide in the soil. Um, and, and none of you see it with the funding calls out there. They're, they always talk about methane, but not so much the nitrous oxide. And that's, you know, it's 298 times more potent than carbon dioxide. And we really need to give it a little bit more emphasis. Um, so that's my thinking around that. Matthias, I'm not sure if I've um, answered exactly your question. No, absolutely fine. I just wanted to get your um, you know, feedback on that. But I really yeah. appreciate it. Thank you, Matthias, and thank you for the collaboration over the years. Oh, always, always a pleasure. Looking forward to more. <laughs> okay, uh, Sharon, so I, I can see there's lots of comments <laughs> in, in, the, in the chat function uh, congratulating on your lecture. In particular, I, I've now worked out there's a Welsh word meaning excellent in there as well, which is <laughs> fantastic. So yeah. We can, we can bring across then Linda, I think, is a question for you. Hi, um, that was a great talk, Prof. Um, so listening to your talk has meant that um, a lot of us female scientists would have been really inspired by the work that you do and the support that we get from you. I've been your PhD student and then your postdoc till present. Um, and one of those people who've really um, seen the support and the faith that you put in others. So I just thought, what is the one advice that you would give um, aspiring young um, scientists, especially female scientists um, in this area and in this field um, that you would want to give them who are hoping that one day they'll be somewhere where you are now? Uh, okay, so uh, you nearly made me cry there, Linda. <laughs> Um, what I would say, you know, what's really got me uh, through is actually um, my enthusiasm for the topic. And most people will know I'm very, very headstrong. 
So you just have to continue if you have the passion for the subject. Um, and a little bit of stubbornness does help, I guess. It does um, ultimately get you through because, you know, I wouldn't change what I do for the world. You know, some days are exceptionally um, challenging. Of course they are. But in the grand scheme of things, um, it's actually meeting the diversity of people across the world working on, on major challenges um, together, which is really inspiring. So keep up the passion, Linda. And I, I know you have a slightly stubborn streak, so you'll be fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay, okay, Sharon. Um, I, oh, I think we've got Robert coming forward. Oh. Robert? Ah, I'm coming through in my Sunday name. <laughs> <laughs> this is John Wallace here, Robert John Wallace. Uh, Sharon, well done. Uh, thank you very much for that. But I do have to apologise that I came in halfway through because I was out in the garden. As you know, I'm retired now. Um, <laughs> and so I didn't hear all the talk. Uh, I do have a I... question about um, the viability of breeding cattle and sheep, I suppose. Uh, for lower methane emissions. What do you think of the possibility there? Sorry, did, um, did you say about breeding? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So you probably wouldn't have seen the first few, few slides then, John. I did give you a special thank you for the uh, years of mentoring. Uh, it's been great to have some of your expertise. Oh, well, thank you. <laughs> So, um, yeah, breeding is, is definitely on the cards. I think when you look at the data that came out of the Roman census, for example, which um, I know you're very, very aware of, what they said that um, the belief is that diet may be slightly more important, but there's absolutely a scope for breeding animals as well. And it's it's a combination of both. So obviously breeding programs are not gonna give you the answer straight away. Whereas dietary approaches are, are a little bit um, quicker, I guess. Yeah, that's right, it's a good point. How are you going to persuade breeders um, to do this? I mean, it's scientifically possible, I believe, and I think you believe as well, um, but there's nothing much in it for the breeders. You mean if they produce methane? Yeah, if they, if they, if they do breed animals that produce less. Oh, I know. Well, they, therein lies the issues. And really, um, you know, that is that is absolutely the policy piece around this and the new agriculture bill that's moving more towards um, payments based on, on environmental outcomes. And until we have those in place, then... You know, there, there is no value because it's it's all still production. So, you know, it's moving towards it, John, I would say, albeit uh, a little bit slow. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Sharon, I think, uh, let me just see, I think we're getting close to our end here. I think there's a question on Thoughts around comparing environment impact of products on a nutritional basis rather than weight and volume of product? Sorry, where is that? So Sarah M has a question. Um, okay. Yeah. Oh, yes, I know who Sarah M Sarah M is a past PhD student of Nigel and so myself. Hi, Sarah. Uh, Yes, absolutely. Yeah. And this will be the work of uh, Michael Lee that we all know very well as well is looking at methane output um, compared to nutritional density. And when you do that, particularly when you look at the value of some of the fatty acids, obviously methane uh, in the grand scheme of the nutrients that are provided by those products becomes quite much smaller. Um, so there is an argument for that, absolutely. Um, you know, it's a complicated area because we all we all know that we have inequity in terms of meat and milk available across the world. And we, um, 
you know, certainly the westernized world does consume too much, but we have to look at the nutritional density as well. So yeah, absolutely, absolutely agree. And I think Michael, you're on the line. I agree with you also. <laughs> Okay, so I think we've time probably with one last question and then we'll move to the final conclusion. And we have a question there from, let me just see a number. There's just a number four and it says, uh, do you feel dietary changes is the best mitigation option for methane and is there sufficient focus on it or should equal focus be placed on management changes? Uh, no, yeah, it should be equal, absolutely, because if you change your, your management practices, you will, you will get very quick responses. And I think if you look at some of the carbon calculators out there, um, which I have, I have actually been calculating based on the family farm, um, you know, there are things that you can change quite, quite easily in your, whether you're spreading slurry, et cetera, and how and when and how much and they will give you that really quick um, reduction. And then on top of that, you've got your diet. And as John mentioned, you also then have your, your breeding. So the, if you see them as a pipeline, you know, management is the, the first thing on that pipeline. Then you have diet and then you have breeding. Great. Okay. So Sharon, thanks very much. I think at, at this stage we, you can you can start to relax. Uh, fantastic uh, lecture and, and a, a great range of, of questions. Um, so uh, absolutely uh, fantastic. So can I, can I ask uh, Nigel then? Nigel, would you like to, to make some, some remarks, I'm sure, uh, and some, some conclusions to tonight's uh, event? Over to you. Absolutely, and, and thank you very much, uh, Jeff, and your colleagues and colleagues uh, here in, in Northern Ireland and across the United Kingdom and Ireland and much further afield. Just what a wonderful uh, lecture we've had from, from Sharon tonight. Absolutely out, outstanding, Sharon. So a very special word of thanks uh, to you. And what a journey from, from Cardigan and Cardigan. Uh, to Bangor, Liverpool, Manchester, Bath, Aberystwyth, and 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 now Belfast, and what what a superb uh, narrative uh, and journey that has been, uh, Sharon. And I think there was one slide there that I would pull out right at the beginning, uh, which uh, uh, which I thought was brilliant for me. It was that Fergie thirty five, the tractor, <laughs> uh, and that girl sitting on the tractor. And, and then you know we both have a, a big soft spot for for donkeys now and your dad leading the donkey and you sitting there and the one behind your brother behind absolutely fantastic image and some of you may know that uh, that for my sins now I, I have a donkey in in northern ireland uh, partly to do with my daughter's fault but we have a donkey so we have a lot of conversation sharon and i about the <laughs> Uh, about the, the microbiome and the productivity and the impact of uh, these equines on the world. Uh, but Sharon, fantastic. And it's been an absolute pleasure uh, for me to work with you from, from 2005 uh, through to today. And I look forward to continuing uh, to work with you and to see uh, you continue to develop. It's also great uh, uh, to hear John Wallace's voice here tonight. I can remember John when we we started out in the in the wonderful world of uh, Ruben microbiology and lipids back probably working together in around 2003 2004 and then we we're, were, were successful in getting BBS received funding here uh, and uh, Sharon was our, our postdoc and there was Stefan uh, Mutzel was appointed as the as the postdoc up in the road with John we had our first project meeting in Aberdeen and John, I remember your words to go forward. We have three years now to go forward, to be productive, but most importantly, to have fun. And John, I remember those words very well. And Sharon, I think we've taken uh, uh, John uh, quite, uh, uh, quite taken those words forward really over the last 20 years of your career. I think, yes, you've been absolutely focused. You've delivered passion, um, but you've delivered some real excellence in your science. And, and there's also a, a big pipeline of impact 
uh, which is coming from that. But that's absolutely sort of the key components, Sharon, that, that are so wonderful about all that you've contributed uh, to science today. And, you know, this narrative in around agriculture, uh, planetary health, and, and uh, agricultural microbiomes, I think that's a really rich space. And I look forward uh, to seeing how you take that forward uh, with your many colleagues, both internally uh, and across the globe. And that systems biology slide that you showed us of all those many little circles and those lines, I know if we were to put Sharon in there, then it would be full of small little uh, circles and many, many green lines of positive interactions right across the globe. And I'm sure that will continue to develop and continue to, um, to enrich. So Sharon, very well done. And, uh, and also just to acknowledge, I know uh, 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 Reese and uh, uh, Mari and Greta will be uh, watching and listening and your mom and dad and all your family. So really great to, to have you uh, with us this evening. Uh, it's just under normal circumstances, we'd all be together now and uh, we'd be acknowledging and cel celebrating uh, your, your success uh, uh, all together uh, this evening. But we're going to do it, uh, we're doing it digitally and, and uh, I, I'd just like to wish you all well and Sean wish you well and uh, go forward and have a great celebration uh, in whatever way you can and wherever you are in the world uh, this evening. Go forward and have fun. Thanks, yeah. Sharon. Thank you. I'll have a glass of red wine, I think, on everybody's behalf. Thank just the you. one, just the one, Sharon. It's only Thursday night. Just the <laughs> one. You, you know me, Nigel. <laughs> Excellent. Bye, everyone. Okay. Thank you very much, everybody, and take care.